In the mid-1960s, car ownership in the UK was rapidly increasing, and if you didn't drive something bodged together in one of the vast array of BMC factories, then you drove a Ford. Despite being the UK's number two, Ford in the 1960s was a purveyor of timeless iconic machines, many of which would go on to change the way we travelled, did business, raced, relaxed, and by the way of your bootlid, your social standing. The Anglia, the Cortina Mark I, the Corsair, the Cortina Mark II, the Escort, the Capri, all undoubtedly legendary machines from one of the most stylish and tasteful eras of car design, and when compared to BMC's output, we still look incredible today. And it doesn't stop there. You have the Thames Trader Lorry, the Lotus Cortina, which in the hands of Jim Clark was an absolute weapon, the GT40, winner at Le Mans four times on the trot. Then there is the Cosworth developed racing engines used in race cars galore, the Fords and Dexter, the Major and Super Major, later developed into the 5000 range, they even made the skid units for JCB diggers. And least we forget the undisputed king of the road, the bank robber's secret weapon, your friend and mine, the Ford Transit. If there was a motoring pie, then Ford had its fingers all over it. And whilst BMC was leading in the sales charts, Ford was leading in number of iconic vehicles. And yet, one machine never got its chance in the spotlight, an electric car that would have sold by the thousands and have filled the role as a second car for many families. An electric car that would have complemented Ford's popular saloon car range and been even a potential mini rival. An electric car that, to all intents and purposes, was right on the cusp of going into production. So why then did Ford pull the plug just as they were about to lead the charge? This is the Ford Commuter. Ford's history with electric cars starts right at the very beginning, and so a quick history lesson is going to be in order. At the dawn of the automobile, the electric car was there leading the charge, along with the great other power competitors, steam, horse, and the eventual winner of the 20th century, the internal combustion engine. However, whilst being let down by the range of batteries available at the time, and the fact that due to being quiet, clean, comfortable, and not requiring starting by a wrist braking handle mounted in front of the car, putting the driver in the racing line of death if the car was to ever surge forward due to misguided preparation, therefore being seen as girly, early electric cars did have their backers. One of these backers, the proud owner of a 1914 Detroit Electric Model 47, was Clara Ford, wife of one Henry Ford, who without checking, I'm going to assume was an all-round nice chap. <clears throat> in fact, Clara was such a proud owner that she actively refused to drive one of her own husband's Model Ts, one of the best-selling cars of all time, instead opting for her own Detroit for personal journeys, and in a similar move, my partner won't let me buy a Willem Forganetti off of Facebook Marketplace. Pfft, women, am I right? I love you so, so much. Please don't be mad at me for making that joke. By the way, just for reference, and not convenient foreshadowing to the problems of electric cars, the Detroit Electric's range on one full charge was 80 miles at a blistering 20 miles per hour. Bear that in mind. Jump forwards four decades, <laughs> Jump forward four decades to the 1960s, and the Ford boffins at the Dunton Technical Center in Essex now found themselves hard at work on their very own electric vehicle, the Commuter. A radical and clever piece of design packaging, it was intended as an electric car for the every man, and with a number of UK companies developing electric cars, including Scottish Aviation's Scamp, the car to coaster, and even BMC's Alakizigonis ambitious design, Ford was set to lead the charge. Unveiled to the world at the 1967 Geneva Motor Show, the commuter was pitched as the ideal city runabout of tomorrow, with the ability to ferry four 1960s sized people in a car half the size of a Mark II Cortina. For size reference, a first gen Smart 42 is 43 centimeters longer than the commuter. Standing at just over 6 foot 6 long and 4 foot 6 high, it packed enough juice for 40 miles of driving at a steady 25 miles per hour, with the ability to hit a shocking 37 miles per hour 
stopped if you really wanted to put your foot down. Power came from four 12 volt lead acid batteries mounted underneath the car for better weight distribution, accessible on a sliding frame hidden behind a removable side panel. This was the same technology used to power Britain's vast army of milk floats and was a proven concept. However, in order to reduce as much excess weight as possible, Ford employed a lightweight Lotus Elan type backbone chassis and fiberglass bodywork with the commuter weighing in at just 550 kilograms. The position of the batteries also allowed for improved interior space. However, the rear was only accessible to the smallest of people and to further save weight, cost and importantly power, the interior was kept to a minimum. Inside, the commuter featured basic controls all within easy reach of a driving position with sliding windows, an Anglia 105 steering wheel and a directional selector with one gear in either direction. Couldn't be easier for the wife. When it came to manoeuvrability, the car was able to do away with three-point turns and whilst lacking the handling finesse of a Lotus Elan, it proved easy enough for short, round town journeys. Styling wise, the car carried a fresh modern look, with design language similar to that of the recently introduced Mark 1 Transit, with clean lines and boasted all round windows in order to flood the interior with light. It even managed to get some studio time with then popular model Twiggy, who posed with the car for publicity photos for the upcoming launch. The commuter was shown off to then Prime Minister Harold Wilson at the official opening of Dunton Technical Centre on October 12th, before it was ferried away to the British Motor Show a week later. Here it was inspected by Transport Minister Barbara Castle, who I'm sure found the controls easy to use. Couldn't be easier for the wife. By the end of 1967, Ford had finally grabbed the top selling spot from a BMC 1100 with the new Mark II Cortina, selling 165,000 examples that year. Therefore, it was entirely possible to see the introduction of the commuter as a second car for Ford households, much in the same way the Mini occupied the spot for larger BMC drivers. However, the commuter would never actually make it to the production stage and would quietly disappear from the public eye for a while after its motor show appearances. Wait, what's that? Oh look, it's for foreshadowing from earlier. Despite huge leaps in motoring technology in the decades since 1914, battery technology had not made the same leaps and bounds, which can clearly be seen when we compare the Detroit and the commuter. This slowness in the advancement of battery technology was not only too much for Ford, but also BMC, now British Leyland, who would persist with their effort, the Leyland Cromford, until 1972, before scrapping the project entirely. Other projects like the Scamp and the Carter Coaster also met the same fate, with the Scamp being shelved due to range issues, and the Coaster being cancelled due to a lack of available ABS plastic production. The inventor of the coaster, Alistair Carter, told the Daily Express in 1967, Within five years I expect to see a quarter of a million electric cars on the road to Britain, and a silent, fumeless commuter shopping car is one of the main developments we can expect from the industry in the next few years. Obviously, this is a development that never appeared, with electric cars disappearing for a number of years, and it taking until the 2000s for them to really start to sell in the numbers predicted in the 1960s. However, despite the lack of progress with the commuter, it appears that Ford was still persevering with the car around 1970, when it appeared in the background of footage showcasing a battery-powered Mark II Cortina estate. Eventually, the commuter was donated by Ford to the Science Museum in London a year later in 1971, where it currently resides today. A photo of this drive to the Science Museum demonstrates the commuter's microscopic size, as it appears to be dwarfed by everything around it. Overall, the Ford commuter was a stylish little car that, given the right technology, could have sparked a promising future for electric vehicles but it was sadly never given the chance to lead the charge. Thank you for watching and make sure to comment below what you think of the commuter. What? As in power? Oh,
Shocking.